Um, good evening, colleagues, friends, postgraduate students, uh, in particular, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, I mean, the Faculty of Science, who's joining us online. I want to acknowledge the head of the school, Professor Dina Naidu, and of course, our inaugural professor, Professor Komen. Thank you very much for making this a lovely evening. But on your behalf and on behalf of WITS, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to your wife and your father who are joining us online. Um, I have no doubt about... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whoever's a physicist, yeah, I mean, I, I know that I feel like I'm in a parallel universe, but today <laughs> I know it for real because I thought my job's like that, but I see this is also like that. But really, a really warm welcome to all of you. An inaugural lecture is very special, and I preside over this um, event this evening. It's probably one of the better parts of the role that I have at this university. My name is Ruxana Osman, and I'm the Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor responsible for the Faculty of Science. I have the pleasant task always of presiding over inaugural lectures, um, Professor Komen, this is a momentous evening in your career. I know you probably think when you do leading research, that's a momentous occasion, but today really is. Um, the order of proceedings is actually very straightforward. I'll be calling upon the head of the School of Physics, who will um, read out Professor Komen's CV. You'll get an impression of the person who stands before you, and then Prof. Komen, your job is really to give a, lect a physics lecture, one that all of us can understand, especially myself from the humanities. So I'll be watching this space. But a really warm congratulations to you for this evening and a special welcome to everyone who's joined here in person and who's here online. Congratulations. I call upon the head of the school now, the head of School of Physics, Professor Dina Naidu. Thank you, Senior DVC, Professor Osman. Um, congratulations, Prof. Komen, uh, on this auspicious day. So first of all, colleagues, uh, I guess the welcome to all colleagues, students, invited guests, and also to Prof. Komen's family who is online. So I would like to thank them also for taking the opportunity to be present this afternoon. <clears throat> Firstly, I'd like to read a short bio of Prof. Komen. Prof. Komen was born in... 1970 in Berlin, East Germany. Since 2001, he has been a member of the ING stereoscopic system, which is the S collaboration abbreviated. During the period 2001 and 5, he enrolled for a PhD degree at the Humboldt University, Berlin. Between 2005 and 2007, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS, in Montpellier, France. During 2008 and 9, Professor Komen was appointed as a postdoctoral fellow at the French Alternate Energies and Atomic Energy Commission, CEA, in Saclay, France. In 2019, uh, 2009 2013, he was a postdoctoral appointment at also uh, CNRS in Annecy, and that's in France. For 2013, the School of Phil Science at Wits University as a senior lecturer. He was then duly promoted to associate professor in 2016. One of Professor Common's major roles this year is he chairs the S International Collaboration Board, which is a great achievement worldwide. His scientific interests span gamma rays, cosmic rays from objects in the Milky Way and a large mega megatonic cloud. He has a NRFC1 rating with more than 200 publications with the S collaboration. So that is a, a very short but distinguished CV, Prof. Common. So in order to move proceedings, I'd like to now uh, move on to the lecture. Prof. Common lecture for this afternoon will be based on very ING gamma rays from the Milky Wave as seen by the S 
uh, telescopes. His abstract, just very briefly, is the night sky as we see it, it represents only a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. Astrophysical sources emit photons of all energies, from the lowest energies in the radio, uh, regime up to a very high energy gamma rays. The field of gamma ray astronomy made huge progress in the last 20 years. And the S collaboration is currently one of the most sensitive instruments for these observations. S has conducted a survey of the Milky Way, revealed more than 70 previously unknown sources of gamma rays. We generally know about gamma rays from the electromagnetic spectrum. That's what we learned in school at first year university. In this lecture, Prof. Common will give an introduction to the S telescopes and will show you observational results of the Milky Way and its immediate neighborhood. He will then discuss what we can learn from these observations about the nature of individual sources and conclude with a brief outlook of future instruments and research projects. So please, Prof. Common, would you come to the stage to draw your lecture? Um, can you check the video, please? Apparently on Zoom, uh, the image is frozen. Thank you. Um, yeah, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dean, Head of School, um, colleagues, students, friends, and family who's joining online. Welcome to make, or uh, thank you for making the time and welcome to my inaugural lecture. What I want to tell you today is about very high energy gamma ray emission from the Milky Way, as we have seen it with Hess. And a long time, a very long time actually ago, when I prepared my, my PhD defense, a good friend was telling me, well, a good presentation has three parts. One third should be understandable for everyone. One third should be understandable, at least for the physicists in the room, and only one third should be understandable for the real experts. So I will not give an expert um, lecture. I try to make it interesting for, for, for everyone. So what I want to do today is, so let's start with what are gamma rays and how can we observe those gamma rays? Then we will take a look at, uh, at the Milky Way. What do we see in the Milky Way? What can we learn from that? Um, and in the end, I will show you that we can do similar observations, similar studies in our immediate neighborhood by looking at, um, at the smaller galaxy, which is orbiting our own Milky Way. So if we look at the night sky, and this is a nice picture that I found on the web, which was taken um, in Namibia, I think. Um, do you see the slides actually? No. Yeah, here we go. So what you can see is uh, this. So this is a very wide angle photo. That's why this looks curved. But this curved band of light that you see there is the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is nothing else than the, the galaxy uh, that we are living in. On the left hand side, and maybe I can point that with my pointer. Here you see two patches of light. Those are the Magellanic clouds. Those are small galaxies that are orbiting our Milky Way. We will come back to that a bit later. Now, what we see here is optical light. The light that we see with our eyes is optical light. Now, if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, so the optical light is only a very, very, very small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And um, electromagnetic waves uh, have uh, a wavelength, uh, which is for, for the optical light, as you can see here, something in the hundreds of nanometer range. But, um, you can also convert it into a frequency. So on this, uh, in the middle band, you see the corresponding frequency. And this also corresponds to an energy, which you see here. When I was preparing this, uh, um, this talk, this is a picture I found on the web because it shows everything I want to show. But, uh, and I'm using that in my lectures, but now I'm realizing there is something off with the energy. This should move a bit to, to the left. But we see everything we need to see here. So the optical light is just a, a tiny portion. And if you go to lower energies or longer wavelength, then you end up first in infrared radiation, then uh, in radar and so on. And if you go to higher energies, then you go to ultraviolet emission, X-ray emission. Then what is pointed out here as gamma rays is the gamma rays that you know of from uh, nuclear decay, for example. 
But what I was what what I am working on is what's called cosmic radiation here. This is radiation that we um, cannot produce on Earth. This is really something that we can only observe in the universe. So now you have this huge electromagnetic spectrum, and you can observe the universe in uh, at, at all those parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, let's start with the visible light. So this is again a visible image, uh, optical light from the Milky Way. But now we see the entire sky. So those are photos taken <clears throat> in all directions and patched together. So um, basically what you see, what you would see above is the top of the image. <clears throat> what you would see below is the bottom of the image. And then you have the left and the right and this will connect behind your head like that. So that shows the entire uh, sky. And the projection is chosen like that, that the band of the Milky Way is just this horizontal band. So this is just a different orientation, but this is, is, is just an, um, well, a map of the sky, if you want. It looks like a map that you find, uh, like a map on Earth. And what you can see here is this, um, this light coming from the Milky Way, but you also see that there are some dark lanes. This is dust that is absorbing the light. Now you can do the same thing in infrared. So in infrared, you can look through the dust. And what we see on the left-hand side now is uh, we see much, much more light because uh, now we are looking through the dust and we can see the central bulge of the Milky Way here uh, where a central massive black, black hole is, um, is located. All those plots I've taken from my um, first year lectures from the textbook that we use in the first year lecture. And if you take a bit longer wavelength infrared, then you see um, <clears throat> then you see the the heated emission of dust. So you see really the distribution of material in the Milky Way. Now, if we go to radio, uh, on the left hand side you see the emission, and I should mention this is all um, those are all false color images. So you take the intensity of your measurement and you convert that into a color scale. In radio, the sky doesn't look red; it shows just a certain uh, intensity at a certain uh, uh, frequency. And what we see here in red is the brightest emission from the Milky Way. What we see here is the emission of hydrogen atoms. And if we take a different frequency of radio, then we see emission of uh, CO molecules, and they are embedded in, in dense clouds of hydrogen molecule clouds. So this helps us to, to trace or to observe or to find dense regions of dense gas in the Milky Way. Then if we go to higher energies, on the left-hand side, you see an image of um, X-ray emission. So what we see here is a lot of emission basically coming from everywhere. So the, uh, the galaxy contains hot gas and the gas is so hot that it emits X-rays. You also see a few um, uh, objects here that are strongly emitting um, X-ray emission. And on the right-hand side, now we are getting close this is gamma ray emission, but this is ob obtained with a satellite, Fermilat. This is high energy gamma ray emission. And what I'm doing is very high energy. So we are going just a step further to even higher energies. And that's what we want to do today. So what is very high energy gamma ray emission or gamma rays? So first of all, uh, if you see light, you will see uh, light always comes in, in small pieces called photon, but the optical light that we see is uh, billions of photons every second. When we do our gamma ray observations, we can really measure, we can really detect individual photons. So we can detect individual pieces of light. And very high energy, what do we mean with that? Um, the energy is something between 100 GeV and 100 TeV. So we are often use electron volts as our energy scale, but you can convert that into Joule if you want, if you're more familiar with that. Now, those gamma rays, as with the gamma rays that you know from um, nuclear decay, this ionizing radiation. So this would pose uh, a danger to, to our health. Now, <clears throat> lucky enough, first of all, the flux is really low. Second, those gamma rays from the universe are absorbed in the atmosphere. So here, we are not exposed to those gamma rays. But now, if they are absorbed in the atmosphere, how can we, uh, how can we observe those gamma rays from the ground? Well, for that, we need a bit more of um, physics. Um, we will create electromagnetic air showers. And in this sketch here, those uh, dots should illustrate the nuclei of, um, of the gas in the atmosphere. 
And now if we have a very high gamma energy gamma ray coming in, it meets such a nucleus. And now what can happen is that the energy, all the energy stored in this photon is just enough to produce two particles. And a particle and an antiparticle, usually an electron and its antiparticle, which is a positron. So you can convert energy into mass. And the rest energy of an electron is something like 511 uh, kilo electron volts. Make that twice because the positron has the same rest energy. So as soon as our gamma ray has one uh, mega electron volt of energy, it has enough energy to produce a pair of an electron and a positron. And now we have those two particles while they meet another nucleus. And what they can do now is they can radiate a, a photon. That's called Bremsstrahlung. This is really the scientific term for that, but Bremsstrahlung is a German word which just says breaking radiation. So what's happening here is this interaction with the, char the charged particle with the nucleus, the charged particles lose energy and this energy is radiated in a form of an of a photon so now we end up now we have already two particles and two photons so what can those two photons do well they do another pair production and they can do another bremsstrahlung and so on so what's happening here in a in a step by step process all the energy that came in in this photon is distributed uh, among particles so on this is an electromagnetic air shower. Such air shower um, can contain up to uh, tens of thousands of particles. And this development is an altitude from something like 20 kilometers in the, up in the atmosphere down to three um, kilometers. So now we want to detect, we want to detect the photon. So what you can do is we just place a particle detector at three kilometers and measure all the particles that coming out that are coming out of the shower. Uh, experiments exist that do exactly that. We are doing something um, slightly different. So we have now all those electrons and positrons, and um, there is a cosmic speed limit. So the speed of light in vacuum cannot be uh, surpassed by any particle. Now, our electrons in the air shower, if I convert, what's the speed of those electrons? Well, that's something like 99 0.998% of the speed of light in vacuum. So you see those electrons are extremely fast. They are almost at the speed of light. Now the speed of light in air is slightly different than in vacuum. It's, uh, it's a bit slower. So the speed of light in air is 99.97% of the speed of light in vacuum. And now if you look at all those nines, you see that our electron is exceeding the speed of light in the medium, in air. So we have a charged particle that's going through air at a speed exceeding the light speed in air, and then they emit photons, which is called Cherenkov light. Uh, Pavel Cherenkov um, discovered that in the 1950s, I think. And what we see on this picture is a, is a photo from a um, nuclear test reactor, which is embedded in a water tank, and all this blue light that you see is Cherenkov radiation from particles coming out of this um, nuclear reactor. And we want to make use of that, this Cherenkov radiation, to measure or to observe the air shower uh, in order to get information about the photons. And how can we do that? So we need, obviously, we need the atmosphere. Without the atmosphere, we wouldn't have any showers. Um, then we, uh, what you see here on the right, so you have the air shower. It's emitting this rank of light, but remember all those particles are almost at the speed of light and they emit light at the speed of light. So all this light is compressed and you see this in this uh, pancake um, shaped uh, things here. And once the light hits the ground, this is where we place telescopes, several telescopes to observe this light from the, uh, from the air shower. And what you see down here is, uh, so we have, if you have four telescopes, then you would see the shower. Those are images of the of the of the particle shower in the atmosphere. But by having four telescopes, you see the shower from slightly different angles, and with that you can reconstruct where the gamma ray is coming from. So you just do the intersection of all those um, light showers of those different images of the same light shower and where they connect. This is where the photos, uh, photon was coming from. So we get the direction of our gamma ray from that. 
And basically the intensity of, of the image, so how bright and how big this image is, we can also measure the energy of the gamma ray. And that's all what we want to know. We want to know where is the gamma ray coming from and what is the energy of this gamma ray. So now we know how this works in general. Here you see our telescopes to do exactly that. So high energy stereoscopic system or short HES was built in, um, yeah, we started in 24, was built in the Kumas Highland in, in Namibia. And we started with four small telescopes. Those are the four you see down here in a square with a 100 meter um, side length. We call them CT1 to CT4. And in 2013, we added this really big telescope in the center, which we call CT5. The big telescope helps us to go to lower photon energies. Let's take a look at uh, our, our telescopes. So this is, an, uh, this is an image of one of the smaller telescopes. So that's a huge steel frame. Uh, you can move it in altitude, so you can move it up and down. And in azimuth, you can turn it around like that. And like that, you can really reach the entire sky. The mirror, you can see that here is made of small mirror tiles. In fact, we don't need a very sophisticated mirror. Uh, a simple mirror like that uh, works out and it's much easier, much cheaper to make a mirror out of smaller mirror tiles. The diameter is 12 meters, uh, focal length 15 meters, and the total area of one uh, telescope, 108 square meters. And here you see uh, a photo of, of the camera. It has 960 pixels. Each pixel is made out of a photomultiplier. Photomultipliers are very sensitive instruments. They can measure single photons. So we get those individual Cherenkov photons from the air shower, which is really faint. So we need a very sensitive instrument for, the, uh, for that. And the field of view of the camera spans about five degrees. So if you look at a certain point in the sky, you can see things uh, with a radius of two and a half degrees around. And this whole, this whole um, one telescope weighs about 60 metric tons. Now let's take a look at the big one. And this is probably will forever be the biggest rank of telescope ever built because we ran in a few problems to, to make that happen. So it's the same thing, a steel frame, but now it's much bigger. So it's much heavier. And I think the engineers really struggled to get everything together, but now it's there, it's working. So the diameter of the mirror is uh, 28 meters, uh, the focal length 36 meters, and the camera has uh, more than 2000 pixels and covers only a smaller field of view, but that's the best that we could do with such a big telescope. And this thing weighs 580 tons. Okay, so now we have the telescopes. So who is operating this, those telescopes? Who is working with that? So, the whole construction and um, operations is done by an international collaboration, the HES collaboration. And currently we are 32 institutes in 10 countries. Uh, it was mostly Germany and France that were driving that uh, initially, but then more institutes from other countries joined in. Uh, for instance, I name here Denmark, they just joined a few months ago. And of course, Namibia is the host country of our telescopes and South Africa are part as well. So we are about 150 scientists where I count the permanent uh, positions, the postdocs, also the PhD students. Then we have a lot of master students, technicians, support team, and so on. And what you see uh, on this photo is uh, a few of us at the meeting we had last year um, in Namibia. All the data that we record is available only to collaboration members. So if you want to make use of this data, you have to be a collaboration member. And all our scientific publications, we all sign our publications and uh, orders are always in alphabetical order. And I show you here an example. And with Comin, you can guess that I'm somewhere in the middle here. Okay, now that we know how it works, what we can do with it, I still need to tell you why we are doing that, but let's have a look at a few pictures uh, first. Um, the Galactic Plane Survey. So what you see uh, on top here is again, such an all sky image in CO emission. So this tells us where we find dense molecular cloud. That's basically that we know where we are. Okay, so you see all this blue things is emission from molecular clouds. Then the region that's grayed out is things that we can't see with tests. So this part over here is the Northern Hemisphere. We can't see that from here. 
this one here, the small blob here, is around the um, celestial south pole, which we could see from here. It's just we can't point the telescope too far down because then we wouldn't observe anything. So what we can what we can observe is everything in between those uh, gray blobs, and this big. Big white box here is a scan, a survey of the Milky Way that we have done. So over the years, we have pointed telescopes in, in one uh, direction, then the next, then the next, then the next, accumulated all the data, stacked that together uh, to get an image of the Milky Way. What you see also here, yellow, is a survey conducted by HEGRA, which is a um, which is an older experiment, doesn't exist anymore. And the small green patch here is Veritas, it's um, an instrument that's located in the United States. They can't see the Southern Hemisphere, that's why they can do only a small portion of the Milky Way. And what we see here, uh, so this uh, second picture here, is the gamma ray emission from the Milky Way. Now, this is very small. Let's try to zoom in and cut it down into pieces. So I've just taken that, put it in four pieces, so we start Top left, go to the right, and when you go out here, you'll get in on the side here, right? We have just taken that apart. Now, um, then everything you see here, so the brighter the color, uh, the more intense is the emission. So you see many, many, many sources here. Let's have a look at what we see, for example. So this one here, this bright spot here, is the center of the Milky Way. In the center of the Milky Way is a supermassive black hole but we don't know yet if this emission is really coming from the black hole or from somewhere else. What we see here, and you see already this nice ring-shaped emission, this is a supernova remnant. We will see that a bit later. And next to it, uh, you see also a big uh, blob of emission, which comes from a pulsar and it's nebula that can also um, emit gamma rays. Then we have this little dot here is a binary system where we have a massive star and some compact object that's orbiting around. We will see that a bit later as well. <clears throat> then this faint diffuse emission is where, um, where particles from supernova remnant get into a dense cloud producing gamma rays. Then we have here a very faint diffuse emission, which is most likely a star cluster and a bubble blown up into the interstellar medium by the star cluster. So overall, in this survey, we have found 78 sources. And here you see how they are made up. So 12 of those are clearly pulsar wind nebulae. Eight are clearly supernova remnants. Composites is a mix between the two. It's one object where we both see the shell and the pulsar wind nebula. We see three binary systems, but more importantly, most of the sources that we have discovered, we have no idea what this is. So we look in other wavelength, do we see some, we see gamma ray emission, then we check in radio and X-ray, is there some object and we haven't found anything. So we have a lot of sources where up to now, we are struggling to really know what this is. Okay, so now before we um, go on, I need to, uh, give you a bit more physics so that we understand what we are seeing here. So such a photon with 10 TV of energy would have a wavelength of 10 to minus 19 meters. So that's really small. If you compare that with a proton, that would be 10 to minus 15 meters. So that's much, much, much smaller than a proton. So you see those photons cannot come from some uh, energy transitions in an atom or in a nucleus. It must be something else. And there's something else uh, we can put that in short, that this is somehow interactions of uh, particles with other particles or fields. So first of all, synchrotron radiation is an electron in a magnetic field, thus synchrotron radiation. Inverse Compton emission is an electron colliding with a photon and transferring energy to the photon. And hadronic emission is collisions of two protons and they can also produce gamma rays. So what we do, um, so synchrotron radiation goes only up to X-rays, but what we do in gamma rays is mostly inverse Compton emission and hadronic emission. So what we're basically doing is we observe electrons and protons in astrophysical objects. So that's what we study. Now let's try to see, um, or let's you know, first give you a bit more details about that. So uh, synchrotron radiation 
means that an electron or a charged particle in a magnetic field, it spirals around the magnetic field lines. And by doing so, it has to emit photons. Those are those synchrotron photons. And uh, the energy of the photon that's coming out from this interaction depends, first of all, of the magnetic field. So the higher the magnetic field, the higher the photon energy. And it depends on the electron energy. So the higher the electron energy, the higher the uh, synchrotron photon energy. And this is an equation that I uh, built up for my PhD thesis that just gives us an idea where we are looking at. So if we take a 100 microgauss magnetic field and the one TeV electron, then we have electron volt photons, which is optical light, but 30 TeV electrons produce already synchrotron photons in the X-ray regime. So X-ray observations help us to observe synchrotron radiation of very high energy um, electrons. Now the inverse Compton scattering, um, we have in a relativistic electron. So relativistic means it has, this is very high energy. It is close to the speed of light, this electron. Uh, you see that here. And you have a photon, a low energy photon. And in this collision, some of the energy of the electron is transferred to the photon. So the photon gains energy and it ends up in the gamma ray regime. And the outcoming um, energy of this inverse Compton photon depends on the energy of the electron. So the higher the electron energy, the higher the photon energy, but also depends on the energy of the photons that, that are coming in. We are usually or always using the cosmic microwave background for that. Cosmic microwave background photons are everywhere. So you can be sure that at some point there is an interaction like that. But other photons like starlight or infrared from dust or even photons from synchrotron radiation can do the same thing. And if we take this simple case of cosmic microwave background, then you can see already you have a few TeV electrons that produce gamma rays in the GeV to TeV energy range. That's why we are doing gamma ray observations. And then we have hadronic collisions and subsequent uh, pi and decay. So on the left, we have a proton, an astrophysical proton with relativistic energy. On the right, another proton, but of the interstellar medium. So that is more or less at rest. And now the two collides. And in this collision, the, the kinetic or some of the kinetic energy of our incoming proton is converted into the production of particles, mostly pions. And pions come as neutral pions but also as charged positively or negatively charged pions. They have a very short uh, lifetime. So uh, those uh, neutral pions uh, decay into two photons. So the main parameter in this reaction is the density of our interstellar medium. So the higher the density is, the more often this reaction can happen. And the outcoming photons have uh, certain energy. So the point is that the pion has something like 140 um, MeV rest energy. So now this mass or this rest energy is converted into two photons. So each of the photon will have roughly half of it, 70 mega electron volt. But now the pion is moving. So one photon takes all the kinetic energy and the other one, not so much. So they, what we observe is not two photons of the same energy, but one photon with a lot of energy and the other one we can't, we can't really see. So um, the median energy of all the photons should be 70 mega electron volts, uh, but the maximum energy can go up to 10% of the incoming protons energy, and this can be in the 100 TeV range for the photon. That's why we want to do gamma ray observations. And as a side note, we will need that a bit later. Those charged pions, they decay as well. They produce neutrinos and muons. The muons decay further on, producing more neutrinos. The point here is those charged pi, while in the same reaction, there are also neutrinos that are produced, which we can use for astrophysics as well. Okay, now let's take a look a bit about the physics, the astrophysics that we are doing here. And most of the things that I'm showing today are the remnants of stellar explosions. So if you have a massive star, uh, when it runs out of, of fuel for nuclear fusion, it will explode in a supernova explosion. So what you see here is, um, is a simulation. It does not, so the explosion itself is very quick, but this expansion of the, this bubble 
uh, the size of that is it can be hundreds of light years. So you can imagine how long this takes. So it's not as fast as we can see that here. So two things are happening. One is that the core of the star contracts. And the other thing is that the rest of the, of the um, star is expelled and expanding. So we have this core contraction and expansion of the outer layers. And the, the contracted core usually builds, um, can make a rotating neutron star, more called pulsar, which can be surrounded by a nebula of electrons. There's something we see here. And the shell uh, expands as well. It can produce gamma rays as well, That uh, what we see down here. Now, um, in such an explosion, uh, the core contraction can also produce a black hole, depending on the mass of the star. It can also leave behind just a neutron star, which is not the pulsar. The important point about those objects is that they are possible um, objects in a binary system, so that they are still orbiting another star. And um, for completeness, I have to mention there are supernova explosions that do not come from the explosion of a massive star. They come from the explosion of a white dwarf, which itself is already a remnant of an older um, stellar explosion. Um, so that there's a second explosion of this white dwarf can produce supernova remnants as well that would look almost exactly the same. And composites would be just a mix of those two. And in terms of energy, so uh, pulsars are driven by rotation. You will see that in a minute, they're slowing down. And this energy that is uh, lost by slowing down produces something else that we can observe. Um, and the kinetic energy in such a supernova explosion is about 10 to 51 erg. So erg is just another um, energy scale, which is often used in theoretical calculations. Okay, let's start with pulsars. So pulsars are neutron stars. Neutron stars have about the mass of the sun, but all concentrated in a small sphere with a radius of 10 kilometers. They are super dense. They are made, they are like a giant uh, atomic nucleus. They are made of neutrons. And then, uh, and they are rotating. And you can observe those rotations because they have a beam of light. And like in this image, when it sweeps over the observer, you see a brief flash of light, uh, and then you don't see anything. And just by measuring by um, the timing of those pulses, you can measure how fast they rotate. And their rotational speeds or periods is something between milliseconds up to eight or 10 seconds. So they're really fast. And you can also measure how they are slowing down. So um, they are clearly slowing down. That means if you have something that's, that's rotating fast now, it's slowing down, so it loses kinetic energy. And this goes somewhere. This is something we want to observe. And the luminosity, so the total energy output or the, 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 yeah, the energy lost in this um, slowing down uh, can be as bright as 100,000 times the uh, brightness or the luminosity of the sun. It's just that we don't see the pulsars with our eyes because the radiation is not going only into optical light, but into a huge portion of the electromagnetic wave band. Okay, can we observe such a pulsar? Yes, we can, but we need some information. We need to know the period and we need to know how it is slowing down. And this example here, the Vela pulsar has a period of 89 milliseconds. And this was observed with the Fermi LUT satellite. So they can permanently observe the pulsars and measure the, the, the period and how it's slowing down. And this is what you see down here. This is what Fermi LUT measures. So what they see is uh, a small peak here, a bridge, but I think they call it the bridge, and then a big peak here. Now, with the information we have from them that we know this is the period, this is slowing down, we can look into our data and see if we see those pulsations as well. And that is, this is what you see on the top. So you see down here, there's almost no background, right? This is going down to zero. Doesn't work like that for Hess. So you see, we have a quite huge background, but on top of this background, we clearly see this peak P2 at the same position as what we see in the Fermi. And on the right-hand side, you see the energy spectrum. So you measure the flux of the photons at different energies. And all those blue points here is what Fermi measured. And when they did that, they said, okay, look at this. The spectrum is going down here, it's cutting off. And you with has no need to look at it because uh, there is no flux anymore. 
we did it nonetheless, and we found something. And this this inset here. So this red box is our result. And you see, uh, it is not as steep as was at what was expected. It looks like going to higher and higher energy. So that was a huge surprise when we have seen that. So that there is sorry that there is more emission at higher energies. And what we are currently doing is so you see our energy ranges here are overlapping. Uh, we try to go to even higher energy because there are theories that predict another emission component at higher energies, but um, we haven't published that yet. This is something new to come in the future. Okay, now let's talk about pulsar wind nebulae. Now you have this pulsar, it's rotating, it's accelerating electrons, those electrons fly away. Uh, they build up pressure against the interstellar medium. This builds a shock front and the shock front can accelerate the electrons again. So this is where they get the electrons get the energy from. And uh, roughly, so of this E dot, what I call E dot here is the spin down luminosity. So the energy lost by the pulsar just because it's slowing down. And only about 1% of this energy is enough to accelerate all these electrons to produce all this gamma ray emission. So what you see here is one example. So the pulsar is located here. And all this emission is coming from electrons that are uh, streaming away from the pulsar. This one down here, this is a different object, completely unrelated. Up here, still another uh, um, object, also unrelated. But this thing is one of the biggest pulsar wind nebulae that we have seen. So the angular size is 0.7 degrees, slightly bigger than the size of the moon in the sky. But uh, in the projection, at the distance of this object, the size is something 48, 46 parsecs or 150 light years across. So this is a huge nebula filled with high energy electrons. Now, this is what we see if we look at our entire data set. So now what you can do is we slice it down into different energies. So you can make the same study at different energies. And this is what you see here. So at lower energy, so less than one TeV uh, photon energy, we see this big nebula. But now we are going to higher energies, you see how it shrinks. And at more than 32 uh, TeV, you see only a tiny bit of emission close to the pulsar. So what's happening here is there are electrons accelerated near the pulsar, um, but the, the highest energy um, electrons they lose their energy very quickly. So they can't travel too far away from the pulsar because they're losing all their energies. While the lower energy uh, electrons can travel much, much longer uh, because they're losing their energy uh, well, on longer time scales. So what we see here is how the electrons cool, how the electrons lose their energy when they're moving or streaming away from, from the pulsar. But this is a study that we can do only with those huge extended sources, and there are not so many of those in, that, that, that we see. Okay, now let's talk about shell type supernova remnants. So you have this uh, ejected material in the stellar explosion. They build uh, often perfect circular shells. And here you see a couple of them. So one, two, three, and the last one are objects that we knew before from other observations. So we knew where we have to look at, and we found the supernova remnants. And you clearly see the shell here, the shell here. This one is Vela Junior, which was the topic of my PhD thesis a long time ago. This one here shows a very peculiar morphology. It shows emission only on two caps of the, of the entire shell. And this one here is very interesting. Uh, when we have, you see that in the name has J something means we have discovered it. We have discovered that in our data, but that time we couldn't make a nice image like that, so we couldn't see the shell. So all we could say there is a source at this position, and other people came, they looked into radio data and found, well, in radio data, we see a nice shell as well. This must be a supernova remnant. So we have seen gamma ray emission from an object, and later on it was discovered, yes, this is also a supernova remnant. And now with our entire data set, Let's try to look if we find more supernova remnants. And a study was made just looking for emission that looks like a shell. And we found three of that, uh, three newly discovered um, supernova remnants in, in our data. Okay, so now uh, we have something like eight shell type supernova remnants in the Milky Way. What is so interesting about that? Now I have to tell you about um, cosmic rays. So cosmic rays, 
contrary to the name, is not radiation, it's particles. This was just called cosmic rays when people had no idea what it is. Now we know it's particles, mostly protons uh, of very high energies, and they're clearly coming from outside the solar system. <clears throat> So there are clearly particles from the universe that are arriving on Earth. And cosmic rays were discovered by Victor Hess in 1912. That's why we gave uh, the name Hess to our telescopes. Okay, so supernova remnants are very good candidates to do this acceleration, this production of the cosmic rays. So this is also something that goes back by well, almost 100 years. Uh, <clears throat> The, the kinetic energy that the supernova explosion delivers would be enough to power all the cosmic rays. In fact, we need only 10% of that energy to describe all the cosmic rays. And there are theories that show exactly that, how you can accelerate particles using 10% of this kinetic energy. So we have those cosmic rays accelerated in the supernova remnant, protons doing hadronic collisions, producing gamma rays. So with, this, with our gamma rays, we can study the uh, cosmic ray content in a supernova remnant. Now, let's take a look at Vila Jr. So this is not the result of my PhD thesis. This is something we've done uh, later on. Um, so what we do here is, uh, again, you see on the x-axis the, the, the energy of the photons. On the y-axis the flux, the energy flux of the photons. Uh, at higher energies is our Hess measurement. At lower energy, the Fermi LUT measurement. So we put that all together. And now you just build a model for what would you expect coming in terms of inverse Compton emission from electrons. That's the red line. What's coming uh, in terms of gamma rays from hadronic collisions, uh, which is the blue line. And now you see both lines fit our data equally well. Just based on that, we cannot make uh, a claim. It's either one or the other. But we also know that supernova remnants emit um, X-rays, synchrotron radiation, so at least some electrons must be present. And so what you can do here is, so here uh, on the right, you see the same red uh, electron model from up here. And here we have, uh, have X-ray emission and radio emission. This is the synchrotron radiation. Now, in your model, you can just adjust your magnetic field such that, so you know how many electrons you have from up here. Now we adjust the magnetic field until it matches our data points, and we find out the magnetic field. In this case, seven microgauss. This is really low. So that would be about the magnetic field in interstellar space. So it makes sense, but we expect a higher uh, magnetic field in such a shell because you have a lot of uh, charged particles moving around, so they should produce a magnetic field. So we would expect a higher magnetic field. So let's say 100 microgauss. So what happens if we have a higher magnetic field? Well, if you have a higher magnetic field to describe the same emission in terms of synchrotron radiation, you have a higher magnetic field, so you need less electrons to make the same emission. If you have less electrons, well, then this red uh, uh, model here will go down. So we need less electrons to produce the same amount of synchrotron, and then we don't have enough electrons anymore to produce all that in terms of inverse Compton. So there is room for a hadronic model, for a contribution of protons um, doing gamma ray emission. And then you can calculate the total energy in protons in the supernova remnant here. Uh, and you see, so I said 10% of 10 to 51 arc, and here we are at 7% of that. This scales with the density. Here we assume one particle per cubic centimeter. This is the density of interstellar space. Uh, we would expect something lower because the, the star before the explosion will push away all the gas, so the density might be a bit lower. But still, this is a good indication that we see, um, that we see protons here. So the point is, oh yeah, the point here is we need gas density to produce the, the gamma rays. Well, how can we do that? Or how could that be done? It's not us doing that. Let's imagine you have a supernova remnant and nearby a molecular cloud, which can have densities up to a thousand particles per cubic centimeter. Now let's imagine the um, cosmic rays stream out, go into the cloud, they produce gamma ray emission, but then you would see the gamma ray emission not from the supernova remnant, but from the cloud. And what can also happen is that uh, the shock front 
really goes into such a dense molecular cloud, and then you can uh, measure those, um, then you can produce gamma rays in there as well. And this interaction of a shock with a molecular cloud can be traced with um, what's called OH masers. So this is very um, precise um, radio emission. So if you find those masers, then you know there is some interaction between the supernova remnant and the cloud. And this is something we have many years ago already um, observed. The supernova remnant is called W28. And on the left-hand plot, this shows the gamma ray emission. So the red and yellow is a lot of gamma ray emission. The shell, as we know it from radio, is indicated by the circuit. So what you see here is not emission from the shell, what we've seen before. You see the emission coming from somewhere else. And on the right-hand side, you see the density of the, the nearby clouds. So the darker the image is, the higher the density. And you see the emission is clearly correlated with the dense gas. So this is clearly an indication that we see here uh, protons from a supernova remnant streaming into, into a cloud. And this is typical for very old supernova remnants that are 10 to 100,000 years old. Okay, now, a small side step, a small side project that I've run um, uh, a few years ago. So we have, uh, we see a lot of sources in the Milky Way and we don't really know is the emission coming from electrons or protons. But now if you remember um, what was happening, what is producing the gamma rays, when we produce gamma rays from proton-proton collisions, there are also neutrinos that are produced. Electrons can't do that. And there are currently uh, neutrino detectors, neutrino observatories, huge observatories. So Ice Cube, they have drilled holes in the ice near the South Pole, uh, putting in optical detectors, and they instrumented one cubic kilometer of ice to measure neutrinos. And they are working very well with that. And they have on Thursday, I think, um, an announcement of a new discovery. So far, they have only discovered but two sources. I think on Thursday, they will uh, announce a new discovery. And KM3Net, uh, similar, they use water in the Mediterranean Sea, put optical uh, modules in the water. It's con currently under construction. And with Andrew Chen, a colleague here from physics, is involved in KM3Net. So there are neutrino detectors, and we expect at least some neutrino emission from those sources in the Milky Way. Well, let's ask ourselves how much. And this is a question I asked a master students a few years back. So Owen, he graduated um, last year. He took all what we know from our gamma ray observations and he predicted the neutrino uh, emission from those sources in the Milky Way. And this is what you see down here. So this is just a model how much neutrinos we expect from those different sources. Now the next step, we have done that only a bit. So we could invest much more time into that is really fitting that to the data and to really see, do we see our model or not? But this will be um, work for the future. Okay, so now this is uh, just an overview of the Milky Way. Now let's come a bit to my uh, really uh, personal research um, field, what I'm doing every day, basically, is observations of the large Magellanic Cloud. So those Magellanic clouds are very small galaxies that are orbiting our Milky Way. So they are on cosmic scales really in our neighborhood. And the large Magellanic clouds, so here you see a nice optical image um, of that. The diameter in the sky is uh, 10 degrees, so that's about 20 times the full moon. Okay. The extension, so the distance is 50 kiloparsecs or 150 light years, if you want. And the physical extension is eight kiloparsecs, while the Milky Way, the extension of the Milky Way is something like 40 kiloparsecs. So this is much smaller than our Milky Way. Um, and the inclination, uh, what do I mean with inclination? So remember this band of the Milky Way. Well, we are sitting in the Milky Way, which is a disk like that. We are sitting in it, so we look into the disk. This is an in inclination of 90 degrees. Why we see the Magellanic cloud with 38, uh, 31 degrees, something like that. So we almost entirely see the galaxy from the top, which helps a lot to distinguish all the different sources that we expect to, to de detect. And compared to the Milky Way, there are a lot of mosts in the large Magellanic cloud. So first of all, 
Stars are usually uh, formed in regions where not one star is formed, but many, many stars. And the most massive stars die away quite quickly, produce supernova explosions and so on. And one of the most massive star forming region in our neighborhood, sorry, is in the uh, LMC, which you can see here. Then the LMC hosts the most energetic pulsar that we know. It hosts one of the most massive stars and one of the most recent supernova explosions. So there are supernova explosions uh, quite often, but the last in our um, local neighborhood was in 1987. And the supernova remnant as in 1987A was the initial reason for us with HESS to make those LMC observations. And since then, so since 2004, we are doing a survey of that and trying to find new sources. So this is this is something I presented a couple of year, uh, years ago at a conference. So here again, you see an optical image of the LMC, and those lines indicate our exposure time or sensitivity. You see, so this inner circle here is 200 hours. So that doesn't mean that we point the telescopes for 200 hours at one position. Remember, we have five degrees field of view, and you just stack that. Then the next one is 100 hours. So we have very deep observations in here. But then this is going down to 10 hours here. And you see we have parts that we haven't even observed with 10 hours. So eventually we want more observations. I come back to that a bit later. But what we can do with that is make a map of gamma rays coming from the uh, LMC. That's what you see on the right. So all those, um, those blobs here is fluctuation. So this, those are not sources. What are sources are, is everything that's in red or in yellow. And we see four sources here. So here are two very close together. Then there's one here, and then there's one here. And if you spot something reddish like here, we cannot really make a claim about that at this point of time. We need more observations for that. Okay, let's go quickly through all those um, objects. Um, the first one is a pulsar vent nebula. So that was the first object that we've discovered in the uh, LMC. Uh, it is powered by the most energetic pulsar. It has a period of 60 milliseconds. And here you see the emission. So this star indicates the pulsar position. You see the gamma ray emission. And again, the gamma ray emission uh, the luminosity of that corresponds only to 0.14% of the spin down luminosity. So the pulsar is losing much, much, much more energy than we need for our gamma rays. And we could do something, and I found this really elegant. That's why I want to share that with you here. Um, here, this is our measurement, right? And on the left here, you have radio and X-ray emissions of the same object. Now, again, you do synchrotron model here. And for the same electrons, you make an uh, inverse Compton model with the cosmic microwave background. This is here. So this model predicts a much lower flux than what we observe. But there are also infrared photons from the star forming region and from a nearby star cluster. They make uh, even more radiation. Okay, so you see our models, how they go up. So in the end, that we see this object at this distance is just because there is a lot of infrared emission that helps us to produce the gamma ray emission. Okay, I have to hurry up a bit. The point here is we can measure the total energy in electrons. And this idea goes back to Professor Oki de Jara from uh, Northwest University who passed away many years ago. What he used is we, we see this energy in electrons, and now we assume this is just the uh, loss of rotational energy. So you just take the difference of rotational energy now, which is for 60 milliseconds, and when the pulsar was born, which is P0, which we want to know. And like that, we found out that the pulsar at its birth must have been faster than 13 milliseconds. So by just measuring all the energy, we can measure uh, the speed of the pulsar 5,000 years ago. Um, then, uh, well, then let's skip that. This, uh, no, I have to tell you that you see that there is another blob here, completely uh, disconnected. This is 130 parsecs away from the um, from the pulsar wind nebula, and what we see here is emission from a uh, super bubble or a super shell which surrounds uh, a stellar cluster. What was um, the, 
yeah, which was what was a surprise for us is we were looking at SN87 here, which is down here. There's not emission from there. So SN87A up to now, uh, there is predicted gamma ray emission, but up to now we haven't detected anything. But I have a new master student, Drew, I'm not sure if he's here. He arrived two weeks ago from Nigeria and his job will be to search for gamma ray emission from 1987A. Um, then we have discovered um, another supernova remnant, um, but then let me skip that uh, because there is more interesting things. So now let's talk about gamma ray binaries. I haven't done that yet. So this object is called LMCP3, was discovered by Fermi Lat observations. And they also tried to find sources where the emission is periodic. And this emission is periodic with a period of 10.3 days. So the emission is going up and down and 10 days later, it's going up again. That makes it a very good candidate as a binary system. This is, and this one here is the most massive binary system. So you have a star in this case with a mass between 25 and 40 times the mass of the sun. And this is orbited by a compact object. We don't know what, but could be a pulsar or a black hole. Now, I knew at this point, I knew already we see emission with Hess. Now I know the period, and I wanted to show that we see emission from a binary system. So what do I have to do? I have to show that it's periodic. So what I do, did one evening is uh, slicing my uh, data into five chunks, starting the analysis, going home, and the next morning I arrive in my office and this is what I found. I've never seen a clear case like that. So you see, um, what we typically do is uh, orbital phase is just divided by time. So we start at zero and at one we are at 10.3 days. And then you just plot the same thing again here. So on the right, it's the same as in the beginning. So here you have this five slices, one, two, three, four, five. And in only one slice, we see the emission and not in all the other slices. And I didn't expect it to be so clear. So like that, we are sure that we see emission from the binary system. And here you see just an animation how the emission evolves uh, over those 10 days. Um, after that, so we know certain periodicity, but we want to know, we want to understand better the, 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 the shape of the orbit. And for that, with Brian from uh, University of the Free State, we obtained observations with the South African Large Telescope, optical telescope. So you can just observe how the stars moving back and forth. And this is the orbit that we found out. So it's eccentric, meaning there is one position where the compact object is close to the star, and then another uh, position where it's far away. The GEV emission starts somewhere here when the compact object is behind. It's increasing when the compact object is diving close to the star. And the surprise was so that the TV emission that we see with PES comes only here when the compact object is in front of the star. Uh, so now we know how, this, um, uh, how the orbit is shaped. And now we want to understand a bit better when and where is the TV emission coming from? We have much more data now. And Ladentra, she is here and she just completed her master's. She has done all this, uh, uh, this analysis. And this is what she found out. So we clearly see emission here at inferior conjunction when the object is in front of the star. We are not so sure about this one here. It looks like being likely before, but you see how big this error bar is. We are not so sure. What was the biggest surprise for us is we clearly see emission, most of the emission coming after inferior conjunction. So when the, when the star, the compact object is moving out already. So this uh, will pose some challenges for interpretation, which we still have to work on. Those results are not yet published. Okay, that's very preliminary, but she will go in July to a conference in Japan to, to show our uh, most recent results. Okay, so are there more sources in the Large Magellanic Cloud? Well, I hope so. We have much more data coming in. We are continuing the observation. So remember those lines here is observation time and we were at 10 hours here. We want to extend this uh, out here and see, for instance, this one here, is this really a source? And Edwin, a new master student present here, 
he will do that. And we both hope for many new discoveries, right? Okay, so what's the future? How does that go on? Well, has remember started 24. We have currently funding till 2024. Uh, but there are ongoing discussions how we want to extend, how we can fund an extension, who can work for that, who can operate the telescopes and so on. We want to have another extension for three more years. The basic idea is we should have an instrument like that, which runs until something better is there. And for the moment, there is nothing better. We are the best. But better is about to come. And this will be the future, the Trank of Telescope Array. So what you see on this picture, this is an illustration, right? This is not a photo. There is nothing yet. But what we want to build is something like 50 telescopes in three sizes. So you see the, those are the big telescopes. They will be smaller than our biggest telescope. Then we have those medium-sized telescopes. They are as big as our small telescopes and a few much smaller telescopes. Overall, we expect 10 times the sensitivity of HES. So you need 10 times less observation time to do the same, right? And two sites, one in the Northern Hemisphere to see the Northern sky, and one in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile to see the Southern sky. On the Northern side, they've started construction. They even have a uh, first light of a prototype of such a big telescope. While in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile, they've just started to build the road and uh, the, the power line. So we still have to wait for a few more years. And as long as we wait, we definitely need HES to continue. And Schrenkov Telescope Array is in international co uh, collaboration with institutes on almost all continents, almost because Antarctica is not there. But other than that, every continent is in this project. Basically, everybody who's doing gamma ray astronomy now is joining the Triangle of Telescope Array. And this will be the future in the coming, let's say, 10 years with a much, much, much bigger um, telescope. Okay, so what have we seen? So gamma rays are basically a new window, new, let's say, last 20, 30 years, a window to the universe. And what we study is, non, is the non-thermal universe. So it's not nothing that was heated up by something. It is col collisions of relativistic particles. And we do so with ground-based telescopes. So we need those air showers. So the funny thing is atmosphere often hinders astro astronomical observations. Here we, need the, um, here we need the atmosphere. It's part of the detector. You have seen that there are many, many different gamma ray sources in the Milky Way. And there are even more sources outside. We have just taken a look at the Milky Way. And the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is my personal um, work, is just a small galaxy. We see similar objects as in the Milky Way, but apparently they are much, much more extreme than what we see in the Milky Way. And the next generation telescopes are being built, and we expect many, many new discoveries in the coming years. And I'm glad to be part of that. And I'm glad to be at Wits University to do my academic work. Thank you. So colleagues, indeed, that was an excellent presentation. And I think I have to stress this to the DVC, something going on at the university. Nukri outlined the foundations of physics in particular astrophysics and astronomy. But more importantly, you went through a span of information. I think it was very important. It spanned from basically technical aspects of your project. It went to experimental observations, in, including theoretical frameworks, data analyses. And I think this is much appreciated by novices today, to the students and also the experts in the room. So well done and congratulations. Now we are in exam time now, uh, Dukri, and if I have to assess your work, I'll give you a distinction with no error bar. So well done. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions? We are running out of time. So any questions, um, we could take it during the break uh, outside in the foyer. So, to conclude, uh, I'd like to express my vote of thanks to, to, 
to Nukri on behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Chetty, the, the Senior DVC, Professor Osman, and also a lot of thanks to, to your family who has observed uh, and be part of your inaugural function, Nukri. I'm sure they're very, very proud of you. And to all the colleagues in the audience, thank you very much together those online. So I'd like to close the function, but I do invite you for some light refreshments and also some snacks outside. And you also have an opportunity to take some progress with Professor Common outside shortly. So thank you very much. I close the function. Thank you.